pull the fourth on and, and you know, as they see fit. Um, certainly at any time, you know, I think people in the audience should feel free to interject, uh, contradict, argue, you know, and so on. You know, I think uh, this is a topic on which we can have some, you know, really healthy discussions and, and disagreement. And uh, we'll see where it goes. So, you know, with, uh, you know, I'm thinking maybe roughly an hour, but if we're all having so much fun, it can go further, further as well. Okay. So uh, let me start things off by uh, you know, trying to look sort of forward as far as you know, where should, um, where might research go from here. And uh, I think what's particularly useful to, to sort of focus the discussion and get graduate students, you know, concrete things to think about uh, is, is if anyone has really relatively concrete challenges uh, for where we need sort of new types of analysis, uh, existing algorithms, and new algorithms. Uh, so put differently, you know, what out there that you've seen in the world just embarrasses you? about the discrepancy between you know, what happens in practice uh, or in the real world, quote unquote, versus what, what you know, theoretical predictions say. You know, so I'm thinking of something like how the discrepancy between the empirical and theoretical performance of the simplex method motivated smooth analysis. <coughs> one example that we had 10 years ago. Uh, some of you have touched on this in your talks. I think it's fine to reiterate it, because probably not everybody saw every talk. But uh, anything that you're really embarrassed by, and conversely, you know, what would be maybe the best case scenario you can think of uh, the theory might be able to contribute to the understanding. Who wants to, who wants to take that first? Let's talk about age. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to me that the um, some of the greatest practical successes have come in the area of low-level data structures that everybody uses. Caching, search trees, some of the basic uh, uh, geometry primitives uh, seem to be, you know, have order in log in complexity. So even if there was uh, distributions out there where linear time might be expected, um, in many situations, n log n is good enough. And so these standby data structures are things that we certainly don't need to be embarrassed by. I guess as we enter the era of big data, where we have to deal with uh, things like, uh, like streaming or map reduce, and log in might be forbidden, and we have to get sublinear, so that's a whole other range of problems. But I think the basic data structures that we teach in the courses uh, ought to be uh, a great value for a very long time. Okay, something that does come up both in sublinear algorithms and sometimes also in linear algorithms, let's say in uh, fixed parameter tractable algorithms, that really there's a lot of emphasis in, um, letting, say, getting rid of some factors that depend on the input size and replacing them by huge constants. So something that I think would be nice to have in theoretical papers, both on sublinear algorithms and on some of the, these linear algorithms is somehow just as an example in the paper itself say with which realistic values for input size does, do these algorithms perform better let's say than exhaustive search or some other <laughs> algorithm. So sometimes if you see these comparisons you realize that maybe what you are 
proposing is not such a great algorithm. Yes. Right, so, so I would suggest maybe uh, Brian back Tim's questions or maybe even once it's sort of a step further than that, you know, sort of the question was where should we be looking for new algorithms and, and where should we be doing other things? Um, you know, I, I think there's just plenty of room out there where there are, there are plenty of algorithms out there that we just don't understand how they behave now, um, and that uh, you know the theory community we might be focusing on, you know, getting some competitive ratio down from one place to another place when there's a perfectly good algorithm uh, that people actually use, and perhaps as a field, I'm not speaking at individual levels, but as a field. Uh, we should be focusing more energy on the issue of trying to understand why these algorithms that work well in practice happen to work well, rather than trying to say, well, I can improve this worst case bound from uh, you know, log squared n to log n, or even from three to two. Um, uh, you know, there, I think, again, this is something that has to be looked at as, in terms of field energy, like where do we think as a field is important, uh, and uh, a supposition that I would have, you know, with of course pressing company accepted for obvious reasons, is as a field there's been too much energy moving in in the direction away from looking at actual algorithms that work. Um, so, so where would you send a say graduate student to look for examples of algorithms that have done to work well in better analyses? Um, well, I, I think just. In general, any area where there's been heuristic algorithms, I mean, I think compute and theory, we sort of shy away and say, you know, heuristics, we can't understand them, that's why they're called heuristics, and, and you know, we, we shy away instead of trying to, to gain more insight into to what or how they might actually work. Uh, I think, and this is part of my talk tomorrow, so you, you were there, is that, you know, I, I think an issue is that uh, success in theory is measured by theorems. Uh, whereas arguably, in the algorithmic side of theory at least, success in theory should be at least somewhat measured on, are you making algorithms better? Um, and uh, you, know, you can make an algorithm a lot better and not have a fox stock get publication out of it. Um, so, so it is hard. I think that's sort of a mismatch in the field right now that I'm, I think, again, is a that the field has to consider and decide if that's the way they want to be or if that's something to think about moving the needle and correcting in some way. So I'm happy to add it earlier since you asked me for one concrete one. So, uh, so one of the area which uh, inspired me a lot is numerous analysis area where uh, you know, in the 90s, they began to deal with very large problem. Of course, the large is no longer in today's standard large anymore. But in the 90s, they reached a million uh, variables, which is uh, quite impressive. And, and uh, speaking of concrete heuristics, there was one family of heuristics which is fairly heavily taught in, in the domain of scientific computing. Uh, without theoretical proof, it is thing called the multi level. So very often they actually have articles, books, and describing applied to combinatorial optimization, numerical method. So it started from this uh, basic idea of multi-grade. And uh, under certain assumptions of uh, uh, mathematical equation, uh, which fundamentally don't have a year, a panel, I was able to prove that uh, it converges in linear time. Uh, but then this principle was carried all the way, including to some of the problem we here, like well, prediction. So for example, uh, my former colleagues at uh, Minnesota uh, developed this very famous tactic called magic for graph partitioning. Uh, I'm sure some of you probably are exposed to matrix M-A-T-I-S, which is a great spelling, uh, because one of the writers, uh, George, is Greek. And uh, uh, so they really demonstrate an amazing performance, uh, actually, uh, on competition of graph partitioning. They, they haven't yet lost many of the competitions. But yet, uh, I think a few times, every time, I think we wrote, Spielman and I wrote into an OSF proposal a few times, we haven't been able to somehow find a way to, to solve it. 
So it still happens. Yeah, so, so that, that could be a very good company, and it could really look into the combination of this worsening multi level with, with combinatorial optimization. And the other thing, which uh, some of you knew, I actually last two years took a chairman job. Suddenly, I have to talk with non theoreticians over the last two years. And in the past, you know, I, I, I'm always interested in other people's what they're doing, but most of the time I'm too busy. Yeah? But now, basically, when people talk, I'm sitting in there patiently listening. And then, for example, I become much more fascinated by uh, certain phenomena. It's just very hard, at least in my limited time, to, to decide how to capture it mathematically. You know, we're trained as mathematicians, we want to capture it, proof theorem, so at least uh, have something somehow have fundamental derivations. So for example, I walk out of one uh, PhD thesis uh, that, uh, you know, when I went to CMU for PhD, CMU was very huge in AI. At that time, one of the central problem, like Armin probably remember that, if he arrived as professor after the year when I graduated, they are talking about developing, you know, some kind of real human system that can communicate like human. And it's all rule-based and uh, it's never go anywhere. <laughs> and then somehow I was sitting in this thesis uh, of defense, and this kid write a, a, a Reed Swanson in his name. He wrote basically a system which uh, uh, producing stories and also engaging conversations. And uh, you know, it's very hard for me as a theoretician, in, as us as a replacement of the committee member sitting there. But then in the committee, there was this English professor. Uh, he was about the committee member. And, 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 and then he said, this is a fabulous thesis because I used these systems and only after 35 iterations of a, a run, I did that. I may not be, I'm not talking to a human, <laughs> right? So, so clearly there's something decisively good quality there. And then this is for example, another colleague of mine, which in an area maybe slightly more quantifiable, uh, 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 he actually received last year's Academy Award. He, uh, he basically produced a so digital bubble, which is essentially used for the second half of our time. Right? So, so, you know, I'm sure many of you saw our time and see this looked quite nice, very realistic human. It's all digital now, right? So clearly there's some beautiful quality there. And, and I was, you know, I was talking with Paul DeVere, who won the uh, Academy. And uh, he said, no, you know, it's all in the algebra. You know, we, we, we have this live studio with 10,000 pictures of Tim sitting there, smiling, crying, thinking, you know, meditating, bored, with different colors. And then basically we have produced essentially any of them in any setting with different lengths of space, right? So, 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 so I think that I actually don't know even how to approach a theorem to say this is a beautiful work. It's just so, so those probably are two concrete things I learned recently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, I want to say something very provocative. Uh, it's all more provocative than it's probably contradicted by, by what I heard today. Uh, but I'll give it to you anyway. So, so there's a theory of optimization, a theory of computational complexity, but. You might say there's a theory of algorithms, but I believe there's no such thing. And uh, let me explain why, what I mean. Our approach to algorithms is not that of building a theory. Um, how do we approach algorithms? We have problems that we want to solve. And so then we design algorithms. And we get very good at designing algorithms. We have very, a very huge arsenal of techniques that we, but that's not a theory of algorithms. That's a, a set of tools to design algorithms. Uh, and then, once we have the algorithm, we focus on it through one particular lens, that of complexity theory. Complexity theory tells us how we should look at algorithms, not algorithms themselves. Let me make a wild, you know, analogy. And like all metaphors, they're very silly, but I think they make a point. Now, suppose we knew about matrices, but we knew how to multiply them, we knew that we needed them, and when we need to build a bridge, we learn to use matrices for that and to, to gain theory. We have some matrices and look at them and we know them very well. 
uh, sometimes we need to kind of classify them, say, ah, here's a matrix, what kind is it? Well, we could have a machine learning classifier and statistics on matrices, these are just a bunch of numbers, and then we classify and say, you know, we have uh, type A, and there's type B, and there's type C, and right there you've got type B, and type B is useful for game theory. So, this is great. There's nothing wrong, by the way. This is not criticism. There's actually nothing wrong in having this kind of knowledge. What is wrong is we would be missing something rather fundamental, which is there is, in fact, a very simple algebraic classification of matrices. And I think this is the state we are in by algorithms, that we have not had the opportunity. And so this is a call, this is not criticism, this is a call for action. We have not had the opportunity to actually look at algorithms as mathematical computing objects and to be able to reason about them. And the problem, then what's the problem? This is not just curiosity. The problem is that I believe there are certain questions we cannot answer about algorithms because we, like in particular, we, can, we constantly underestimate the power. That's why, why is the perfect law balance so damn difficult? It's because algorithms are so damn powerful. And the reason why we cannot get a, an angle is because we have this very narrow focus. And maybe since we're supposed to advertise our talks, I'll talk some more about this tomorrow and give you some concrete examples. Uh, but I really think that there's a whole... Now, I'm very sympathetic to Michael's point that I, I really, you know, I really do not believe in theory for the sake of theory. Okay? And just a theorem because it's, it's a nice curiosity. It's certainly not at all what I have in mind. But what I'm observing is that now there are certain questions which we cannot answer. And they could be questions with a great practical relevance. And I believe the reason we cannot begin to answer these is because we don't even know how to look at the problem. It's not that we're not smart enough, well, I'm sure we're not smart enough, but that the issue is we do not have the right perspective. And part of the reason is because, like we've held matrices by running classifiers, not by ever bothering to actually look at what happens when, uh, you know, how you define those matrices. And so, uh, anyway, so this was meant to be, to be provocative, so you, you're supposed to say, so a question is, how do we get more insight into this high level question you're asking as a field? Do we get it by continuing to focus on mathematical formulations and theorems? Or do we get it by sort of going into the wild a bit more and talking with the you know, people who actually supposedly implement the algorithms or solve any problems? And, you know, my concern is, again, you know, I'm not speaking at the level of individuals, but the level of the field, uh, that I'm not sure that we're doing a great job of <laughs> that balance. Um, and uh, the concern is that when someone does become successful at, on the practical side, uh, uh, you know, that they stop publishing in Fox Stock and you know, start publishing in you know, maybe more domain-specific things because it's not considered a home for that sort of work. Um, and that can be good for the field in the sense that, you know, look, there's a value of theory that can use theoreticians publishing in other places. But in some sense, I feel it diminishes the field in the stock box sense of, like, why aren't these really great works that other fields are finding so important? Why would they never actually find a, a home in our own field? Because they don't. So maybe you can add something very quickly that I want to, uh, because I really agree with you, Michael, and this is not just for the sake of being civil, it's because I actually do agree with you, and I think <laughs> you the politics or the sociology, then I think there's room for improvement. In particular, I think that uh, 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 we, the system does not reward talking about failure, talking about why certain approaches don't work. I mean, there are certain, you know, uh, lengths through which we value Board, uh, work and so for just to be very specific, uh, some work I did some time back with Mona Singer Princeton and some of her students in computational uh, biology were doing such a uh, position in some kind of protein folding like thing. And again, we saw that C plants was basically solving those ASDPs, you know, just um, I mean, most of them were, you know, give us optimal solutions, and these are these are NP-complete problems. And, you know, all the obvious re reasons didn't work. There's no really one in the 
the Excel. So, so, but there is really, to me, a fundamental exciting question. Why are all these problems which are supposed to get me hard, why are they easy? But you know, to be honest, I would hesitate to give this to a student and say, now, now you spend six months, you work on this, and, and chances are, even if you find something quite exciting, it will be unpublishable. And th so that, I think, probably is a question, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm just being pessimistic, but I think that's a very valid question I think about the field as a whole. So to add on to that, I'm working in you know biology uh, domain also, and there's a lot of times I run into problems that are like a little bit non-convex, and it doesn't matter. You get the optimum, or you get a really great answer. And I think there should be a theory of uh, maybe there is a theory, and I just don't know about it. That uh, so, for example, for an EM algorithm, expectation maximization, just like Everyone here probably knows k-means algorithms. So you're trying to cluster points to you're putting down k centers to minimize the sum of squares of the distances of the points to the center of the cluster. So there's an algorithm for that, and it works, you know, pretty well. But I don't know of any theory saying uh, why it works well and how many dimensions does it start to break. And you know, I think there should be some sort of quantitative theory of for. Uh, non-convex optimization, saying this is just a little bit non-convex, it won't hurt you. Um, and then something completely unrelated, but since I've got the floor, I'll throw it in. So something I've been interested in watching a little kid learn to speak. The kid is talking pretty well after hearing maybe one billion words total of you know English over a few years. And um, you can't make a machine do this, so I'm actually interested in the opposite of the Google case of, you know, the, you have a hundred billion a data set of size a hundred billion or bigger, and uh, look how great it is. I'm interested in efficiency of learning um, because I think that's really interesting also. And just to throw out one little example of where an algorithm makes a big difference, I ran into a friend um, the other day who says, "Oh, he's going to get rich off of." 3D luggage scanning. So when you check baggage, is supposed to get scanned, and they'll <coughs> look at uh, <laughs> um, you know what's inside. And you know this has been ordered for you know seven or eight years, but they can't do it. So he's hooked up with people who have built like a kind of like a medical CAT scanner for luggage, but they can't take you know a few minutes on each each piece of luggage. So they mounted like 30 x-ray sources and they get all these projections, you know, x-ray pictures of the baggage. And um, then they get a 3D reconstruction of what's inside. And I said, oh, well, what was the hard part? You know, how, kind of, how did you do it? And he said, oh, it's what you told me about. And I said, me, what did I tell you? <laughs> and I had pointed him to an algorithm from the 3D, from electron microscopy literature which I thought had a nice algorithm for 3D reconstruction that was a lot nicer than the way they normally do it in medicine, which has cubicle voxels. And this one had like radial basis function voxels. And he said, oh, that made all the difference. The pictures looked a lot better. So, and again, that's an efficiency thing. They went from 60 scans, which is the standard in medical CAT scanning, down to 30. And then the quality went downhill, but they could, with a little bit of tweaking, they could get it back up again. So maybe uh, building on it, so you had asked about things that, you know, sort of directions of the field, things that are sort of embarrassing. So let me try going through this. So I guess I see some of the purposes of our field are trying to understand the inherent um, complexity of problems. We want to understand for various problems, um, you know, how hard are they? What what do the hard cases look like? And, and you know how um, uh, right, so either on a problem basis or or you know, what what the hard instances look like? And also for algorithms, what are the kind of what is the sort of uh, class of important different algorithms, and, and which ones would you want to use for different kinds of problems? Maybe sort of at a, at a high level. And so worst case analysis has been you know reasonably good. I mean one of the things that's nice is that it gives you something where it, you know, empirically, it's been the case that in order to beat some bound, you've had to come up with some new technique. I think that's one of the reasons why why we, we kind of like it. Um, but 
Uh, on the other hand, right, there are a lot of cases where uh, the model's so pessimistic that you just can't distinguish between a, a totally dumb heuristic and one that seems really interesting. They both get the same worst case bound. Or you get a situation where, so, okay, so in terms of maybe things that are embarrassing, you know, there are a lot of interesting problems with, with the following characteristics. We have some, the current best algorithm, something kind of complicated but pretty cool, and then there's a hardness result that is incredibly complicated to create some, some hard instance. So the reason why we maybe can't do better than something is because of this incredibly complicated to describe hard instance. So what does that mean? Does that mean that, I mean, it could be that just these hard instances are just sitting there in this you know, bizarre little space, right? And everything else is easy. Or it could be that actually there's a lot of hard stuff all over the place. We just can't prove they're hard. All we can prove are these really bizarre, complicated things. We don't really know like, like what's actually going on. Um, in there. So, um, so one of the things that I think is, is useful, uh, one, of the, the, one of the reasons why one might want to have non-worst case models, like there's several reasons. One might be that we, we you know, want a model that actually captures you know, the real characteristics of, of problems coming from particular domains. Another model reason is to, to, to be able to now make a more fine distinction between algorithms that, you know, kind of a dumb strategy and a more intelligent strategy that the worst case models can't distinguish them. You know, so for example, in the case of maybe you know voxels of one kind versus another, you know, a good model, ought to, you know, you'd like to be able to have a model that can help you make more progress where you've gotten stock on a worst case, you know, worst case model. Or now with this model, gives you another thing to try to optimize for. And you know, maybe we're stuck in the worst case. This other model we can optimize something else, and, and then the model will be a good one if, in fact, in order to beat the previous algorithm, you know, you've had to come up with a new idea. Or now you know what works well in practice, you know, gets good performance. So I, I guess I see both of them as 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 we would want to have. Maybe just a couple quick things, maybe. There's at least one other topic I want us to discuss. Was there these last two quickly? Jeff. Uh, so this is kind of a follow up on Tim's question. I kind of, the answer wasn't as satisfying as I as I thought. Um, so it seems like what's really missing. Uh, we, we heard a lot of like tales from the field, like, oh look, uh, I went into, uh, I talked to some practitioners, and this is what they're really doing, this is what we, what we do. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, what's missing is kind of a catalog of various experience in the field, where where, where good worst where worst case processing algorithms work, work well, where they didn't work well, what do those instances look like? Is that information out there somewhere? Uh, I tried to find it, I didn't spend that long, but I didn't have much luck. Is that information out there? Is there a catalog that you can send a grad student to and say, oh, look, look at this large kind of Gary Johnson-like survey of, uh, of all these problems where all things have been tried, what worked in which case under what kind of instance? Uh, is this information out there? Can it be cataloged? Can it be put in a book? Or is it just, uh, does one have to put on their work boots and go into the field for a year before they can collect kind of a, a high-level view of what's really going on? Well, there are various uh, cases where that kind of thing has been reported. Uh, Dynamax ran a number of competitions for problems like uh, graph coloring, and there were reports on how these different algorithms compare. So, you know, some of that is out there. I had a couple of thoughts. Uh, I know Tim wants to move on, but uh, a quick, couple of quick thoughts about maybe there are interesting formulations that have to do with the relationship between the poser of the instance and the designer of the algorithm. So, for example, I mean, one thought is, um, is it the case that the hard instances of satisfiability have high Kolmogorov complexity, high descriptive complexity? I don't know offhand whether the bad examples that have been constructed uh, have that characteristic. It would be interesting to know. Maybe any, maybe we could think that um, when people generate instances. Um, they're a little bit like Turing machines with limited time and space, so the instances aren't really that complicated for some reason. Uh, another possibility would be to consider games be between the proposer of the uh, successive problem instances and the chooser of the algorithm. So I suppose there's a, a wall between the uh, user of the algorithm and the designer of the algorithm, and the user is trying to um, fool the algorithm by giving a hard instance, and, but the designer is not revealing what algorithm is using or, uh, or, or even has a repertoire of algorithms and can 
pick from them according to the behavior of the user. Do we have any analyses of situations like that? Maybe problems that are NP-hard could be shown to uh, be easy in that setting because the user won't be able to pinpoint exactly how full they are. Thank 
support, we can reach easier instances of this is a possibility. Uh, another domain where possibly we can have some sort of characterization of the input and theoretical result. And another uh, thing, uh, I think part of the average case analysis, the way I see it, is really to inform worst case analysis. So for some of the random models, the way I look at them is that really to understand also worst case. And uh, there are problems that we don't know how to solve on random instances, and this is currently maybe the, the obstacle to getting better algorithms. So, um, so for example, if you look at reputation of random result, we don't know how to do it. We seem to be stuck, it's a well-defined model. And my hope is that if you improve on this particular problem, you might improve the worst case for a lot of other problems, because you need to come up with new ideas. And there are many examples like this. So I think that, for, for my point of view, part of the reason to do average case analysis is eventually to get to better things also in the worst case. I mean, something that didn't quite make it fully as I wanted in my talk, so I'm really happy to talk about it. Um, <laughs> so, computer science to me feels really unusual when I look back in my education in terms of how we approach things with worst case analysis, for better or worse. So, if you look at queuing theory, you look at any standard queuing theory textbook, the first thing they'll teach you is what, I think many people would probably know, that the MM1 queue, so it's uh, exponential service times, Poisson random arrivals. That is model one, right? And then, you know, sort of your first year of queuing theory might be to try to expand on that analysis to handle things like more general service times distributions and more general arrival distributions. But even there, they're sort of, they're working under a probabilistic data model that starts out as simple as possible and then expanding it outward, right? If you look at coding theory, right, what were the original coding theory results of Shannon, right? That well, you know, things either get erased or bits flip with some probability p, right? Each one independently. So they start out with a random model and then later people go back and say, well, maybe a first model is a bit better. Or, you know, they try and enrich that basic probabilistic model by adding features to it. And so when I look at other aspects of my education, it's almost strange that CS, you know, when we teach algorithms, we start in completely the opposite direction, right? Our, mo our model, as you say, is that we're facing, you know, Murphy's Law or the worst case, something terrible is going to happen, and whatever we decide, it's, it's going to be the worst possible thing. Uh, and so, it, so I think the idea of using data models is important because uh, it, it will you know, arguably get us closer to, to reality, uh, that even if, when it doesn't get us the right the right answer because the data model isn't inherently correct. It tends to give us very good insights uh, and often will give us rules of thumb to what people find in many, if not all, realistic situations. Um, in some sense, if I had to say what's one of the nicest things that's come out of the power law revolution in terms of what it's meant for computer science is that you, know, you now see papers that sort of say, hey, these algorithms we have we do a lot better if we just assume it's a power law because power laws are cool and that will get our paper accepted. So power laws are sort of dropping off in their, their coolness factors. That's not clear that the last. But for a while, it at least opened the door that you know, it was okay to assume that you had some sort of random power law graph model or, or something underlying your data, even a deterministic model, right? You just say, well, look, the degree distribution falls at power law some deterministic sense. What does that mean? Can we come up with a better algorithm? Uh, and people have. And I think it sort of broke open the doors a little bit uh, in the last you know, decade or so for looking at those sorts of things. Um, I think that's an interesting starting point. I don't think it should be the end point of that sort of analysis um, for our field. Uh, one example that I think is instructive is the uh, uh, sequence of the uh, sequencing of the human genome. So um, it's an NB high problem in various formulations. Um, and it's recognized that the reason it's hard is that when you have these little pieces that you're trying to put together, 
if the genome has a lot of repetition, a lot of repeated substrates, then it becomes quite ambiguous how to place these little pieces and the problem becomes difficult. Um, and so for that reason, um, the general belief for many years in the community was that you couldn't do uh, brute force sequencing, but you had to use some much more complicated divide and conquer approach that uh, involved many different technologies and was very expensive. And uh, Gene Myers and a colleague of his made a very careful study of the exact nature of the repetitions that occur in the human genome. There was a lot known about that. It was known that, you know, that it was more or less IID random stuff except for these repetitions. And they got a very concrete description of what these repeated sequences were. And then through careful simulation, they were able to show that factoring that into the data model they had every reason to expect that they would be able to sequence the human genome, and then they went ahead and did it because of great breakthrough. So it was all really based on very careful description of the particular data set, the particular instance that they were going to be involved with. I find that, that um, in some sense turns around a little bit. I think there are also a lot of problems where the input itself um, uh, is the result of, the, of design decisions by uh, a domain expert. So for example, in a machine learning context, if you want to do machine learning over whether it's, whether it's images or documents, how they are represented as features is a design decision of the, um, the domain expert. And because of that, I think to the extent that we can use non-worst case models to get a sense of what you know, the easy cases look like for a problem, we can then go back and, and, and provide advice to people who are, are deciding how should they represent their data and say, hey, you know, if you know, we, you know, in the worst case, you know, we have these sort of results, but you know, we have the following kind of results for data of the following type, because of the following type. So, you know, if we can, you know, extract these these interesting things that we can do well, then we can go back and inform the, the, the domain experts, saying, okay, you know, when you're thinking about, gosh, what should I use as a feature? What, should, what, what properties am I looking for? Then we can give some advice, advice there. I think, if you think of it that way, then, then there's a, so just to mention one tricky issue. So for example, if you take a problem like reset, you know, we have these phase transitions. That doesn't mean, given an instance, oh, let me just add some fake extra variables, a bunch of clauses to push it above the phase transition, or blow up, right? So you guys have to be a little careful what you mean there. But, but nonetheless, I think that you know, if we get an understanding of properties, maybe structural properties of how the clauses and birds uh, and variables relate, for example. That, you know, might be a little bit like that. Okay, so I would like to tackle some of the questions and also address Shadeen's question, whether you should put it on the talk with practitioners. That's quite like, you know, real data. Uh, so, uh, I think, uh, I think the demo, the one example which briefly inspired me that uh, it was one year uh, one of my office mate from CMU, he went to uh, Intel, that's during the pandemic of 1994, and because he's quickly on the rise, so he had to do this uh, large-scale model checking and simulation for pandemic. At that time, pandemic was only 2 million transistors, but it's huge for his day. And, and uh, so, so at that time, uh, his advisor, actually, Randy Bryan, who eventually became the of CMU, uh, as you know, this whole BDT theory, and uh, but then one of his students say, those things don't work for modeling the circuit because nowadays you have two million transistors, you have to simulate the R. And uh, so, so there's an argument actually, a technical report out of CMU to say, you can't do it, just like the sequencing is too complicated. So, my, my office mate, this Indian guy, who, uh, he had very simple intuition, so that's why sometimes. Domain experts somehow carry a just simple enough key that allow you to, to move forward. He basically keep on saying, oh, you know, the, the Intel circuit is so hard, there's so many pipelines. It's very hard for me to believe we cannot in parallel simulate the parallel circuits. And, and, and sure enough, eventually he's able to, and his team, uh, I, I was participating with them, is able to, using that principle of the parallelism, embedded in the circuit. 
to eventually provide the decomposition and uh, an efficiency relation. So, so, so because sometimes, uh, you know, as a theoretician, we often pre-imagine things, we make up things sometimes, and we sometimes believe the model we build until actually occasionally we, uh, we check with the uh, domain expert and we realize we actually convert both, but there could be just a small key, you know, tomorrow Ryan we talk about uh, this bad word, small key, somehow just uh, place you closer to there. So, so for example, in, our, in my youth, when Dick talked about in his youth, he like random structures, and we were all inspired by him to do this random analysis. And as a geometer in the 90s, you know, I love this random point sets. You know, nearest neighbors, a lot of triangulations, polytope. And here, uh, you know, my, uh, Marshall Byrne lead me into this mass generation domain in numerical analysis. And when, when I went to a conference, I tell them, just a triangulation easy, just, you know, you, you just have random points. You, you point look random to me when you see me in the first week. And then it turned out that the point looked closely enough to random, but it does not have small angles when you triangulate it. Right? So it's almost like a very teeny reprocessing of the random points. For example, you have upon these features, you can draw a disk, take an independent set. Then suddenly you are getting really close to the point set the model. And then that is a beautiful property you can use, even theoretically derived from. And in the same, I think in the same year, I was very happy to enter the numerical things. Uh, I went to NASA for, uh, for, for you know, to, to work on scientific computing. And there's this guy, his name is Paul Simon, he's not head of uh, a large Berkeley lab, or at least close to our Berkeley lab. And he actually was promoting this spectral partitioning. The reason he was famous in spectral partitioning, so this is before the reticent talk about spectral partitioning, is because he's a domain expert of Manchester's code, numerical code. So, so he had quickly computed eigenvectors, and then he's famous in the whole parallel processing because he delivers package for partitioning. And, and, and uh, you know, before that, I really don't think practitioners respect theory. I was very purely trained as theoretician. But I went to NASA, and uh, so for science, basically, you know, Dan Spielman and I was looking at the expander graph, uh, planar separator, all those things. So I had a few meetings with uh, for Simon. He said, that you guys seem to have the best knowledge to be able to prove me something which has been elusive for practice, that this spectral partitioning works. And, and eventually, Dan and I wrote a paper, uh, actually, and the, the mathematical result is the eigenvalue of planar graph. But our title actually says spectral partitioning works. Precisely inspired, actually, they almost framed the problem for you to say, you know, if you look at all the experiments we did, you know, in all parallel computing for fluid dynamics and simulation and advanced rockets, my code never failed. There must be a theorem. And, and it turned out that, you know, we didn't prove exactly what they made us. You know, we proved for planar graph, but it at least captured certain imagination of, uh, you know, those are meshes and somehow related with the planar graph. So, so I guess, you know, sometimes even though it's very difficult for us to precisely model the real data, and some, you know, we, we give an attempt, you know, try to catch some imagination, advance some, you know, probabilistic techniques, and, 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 and maybe also push up, you know, a certain guidance to uh, getting us closer to practice. But somehow each time, at least I feel, uh, with this random interaction with practitioners, they somehow hold this short key very often, and very close to our imagination, and this short key for certain phenomena that we can explain. So, so I guess maybe, you know, it's a good idea that we don't have a standard library of hard instance for you to study. Maybe it's actually good to go out and talk to people. Right? Maybe I'm going to uh, add a, a word of caution about this. So it's uh, well known that uh, this, you know, we're in this data century direction in which computing is evolving. And, uh, and, uh, and there's no doubt that uh, our models have to be better informed by real world data and all of that. And it's impossible to disagree with that. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think that uh, the relation we have with data is not necessarily right. So I think it's commonplace that there's two kinds of data. 
There's the data that's generated by a computer, which you use to test your algorithm. And there's the real world data. So one is artificial, and the other is the real world data, presumably not generated by an algorithm. On a superficial level, that's right. That's a correct image. But, but, but dig a little deep inside, and you will have to reject this view completely, because, uh, because I would argue that all data is generated by algorithms. Just some algorithms which we just happen to design ourselves and write ourselves and put it up, and they're completely wrong. They have nothing to do with the data that we have in mind. But, but natural data is also produced by algorithms. And so now, this is important to, to realize this, I mean, or to disagree with that. But I think if you agree with this, I think it's important to keep this in mind because there I think we have to distinguish between uh, being scientists and being engineers. And both are equally worthy you know, propositions. I'm not making any judgment here. I, I'm just pointing out that there are differences that, that are worth recognizing. For example, I could, not to mention any specific example like Google, but I could imagine trying to, to write up a tra an automatic translator from Russian to Chinese. A and maybe I could do a great job, it would work perfectly, and it would know nothing about Chinese or Russian. It would just have these you know, gi a giant corpses, uh, cor corpuses, cor corpora, uh, corpora, <laughs> and all these years of Latin that come back, uh, corpora, and then all these statistical method, it would do a great job. So as an engineering project, it would be a triumph. Uh, as a scientific one, it would be a failure because it wouldn't tell you anything about Russian or Chinese. And so there, the, I think we're sort of thrown back to this sort of behavioral Skinner type thing, which you know, Chomsky rejected. We say, well, at some point, you're going to have to explain why these data came back, why language came back, why. So in biology, this is a very good example. You've got all these data, and you want to analyze it statistically, classify it, and so on. But at the end of the day, if you do science, you're going to have to give us a narrative, you know, through evolution that explains why we have this data and not something else. What happened? What is the algorithm? And I think this is not just some kind of nice way of some imagery to talk about it. I really believe those are the means we have to do science differently. Uh, when we recognize that data actually comes from, you know, unknown mysterious algorithms, which as scientists we have to go after. Just to be controversial, that okay. <laughs> so, but in some sense, you know, like you said, you point out the tension between science and engineering. Not tension, not just no, uh, right. Uh, that's a differences, but I think you know, we're at a stage where the two are coming together, maybe even more than they, much more than they have in the past, because we're being so overwhelmed with data. The data is going to affect how we even think of the scientific <coughs> enterprise that we have, just much more available to us, and. That can be good or can be bad, depending on, on, on what we do with it. But it does suggest that you know, rather than think, uh, or rather than focus exclusively on the abstract models, you know, we have real stuff available to us that can, that can help inform us in dramatic ways. Um, and so the question is, you know, how how is the field that we consider that or make use of that? Um, you know, should we be should we be more engineering like in some of what we do? that be you know, acceptable within, the, within the theory? Well, I, I just want to add one thing. I mean, I think that one has to recognize that there are differences of purposes. So, so I mean, I, you know, one thing is I want to cross this river as engineering. The other is what is it about water that I, I can swim through and it helps me, and that's science. I mean, the purposes are different. So I think, yes, they meet because a lot of the knowledge become common knowledge to both. And it's very useful for both. One informs the other and vice versa. But at the end of the day, the purpose is fundamentally different between the two. And I think this is not just philosophy, I really think it also translates into ways we work. Um, so, a couple comments from the board. Um, so, maybe uh, following up on this conversation, one, one issue that like, I personally always want to mention now when I try to work with someone on real life problems. Is that if they give me a problem, I want to think about it, I want to find some structure in that problem, or at least understand the problem. But there's always this competing approach, which is they would uh, run a knife based classifier in terms of the solution. Um, and so it almost seems like uh, even trying to understand the problem, they don't, 
in the real world, if you don't even have time to understand the problem you're trying to solve, or identify a structure, or do anything else. But as I wrote this, is, an entire training is that you're given a problem, you try to understand this common to this structure, and then do something about it. Does any of you have any advice about uh, how someone who's trained in an environment should try to have uh, work on real world problems in this, uh, this budget of sense? They were treating the problem the way we would treat an instance. So the, in the sense that, uh, right, I mean, if you just think of these different things as different instances, like we wouldn't analyze the specific instance of it. Maybe, maybe that's what I'm thinking about. They think of a problem as an instance, and so they say that the naive based classifier is going in the class. Mm -hmm. The those naive based classifier is this problem. I don't even understand what the naive based classifier is. I think that it's easier than anyone else. So it's probably the problem. And then some results come out, and then uh, that's the mm -hmm. solution. I mean, maybe the answer is don't work on the right problems. I mean, just as a field, I think it's important that we know that that's out there and that we use it or view it as a baseline. Something that came up early in this panel is that often we come up with new algorithms or ways of doing things, but we don't make the effort of judging their success uh, in the sense of testing them on in real world instances or trying to say things like, this size, you know, just exhaustive search would work better. This size, or our algorithm takes over. So in some sense, I, I think the important aspect of what you're saying from the point of view of theory is that we have to know that those tools are out there, and if what we're coming up with isn't beating the black box that they have readily available to them, uh, then we need to work harder or pick a different problem where we can have more success. So I wanted to make two points that I thought were contradictory, and I think I resolved it by deciding that we are conflating data and problems. So like I, we might talk about what we teach. I like to teach algorithms without the data model. Because one, it's so powerful to have an algorithm that always works, but two, because if you write a piece of code that works on your problem and give it to your friend, they will run it on some instances that are so annoyingly different, they'll complain about your code. And I've got many emails of that form. And so you know, if you just write something that works for your instance, and just be, when, it's, it, computer science is not like physics. But in physics, there aren't too many different parameters. You drop a ball, you got to know gravity, you got to know the viscosity of the movement you you're dropping. If you know a few parameters, you know what will happen. Whereas people will run an algorithm where your data structure got this one in so many different situations that I want. I, I feel that, you know, it's very, that's why I want to do things often that are data independent. You know. But on the other hand, you, I do think you need to motivate the problem as a sanity check for whether or not what you're doing makes sense at all. Like I would say a lot of stuff in your algorithms, I can't figure out what problem they're solving. Um, and I think when you have a problem in mind, then you can say, okay, yeah, this algorithm is good, or you have an application. So I think one of the great things for us to do is show us what we strike one. Have problems that people actually want to solve and think about those, and that helps you formulate the right algorithm and some test instances. So yeah. The best case is when the data doesn't show up in the theorem that guided you to prove the right theorem. Is that what you're saying? I'm not sure. Well, I, of course, there's also a difference between what I want to teach and what I want to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you know, it's if that would be, yeah, if the data, yeah, well, I'll think of the data as being problem instances, or sorts of problems we'll solve, rather than, you know, I've got a corpus of a thousand problems, and, you know, we'll just work on those particular ones. I'd like to make a couple of remarks about working with practitioners. Um, there are some things we do that make us appear to be income groups to the outside world. <laughs> Uh, a typical example is um, uh, stating, uh, give, getting an algorithm for some problem that somewhere within it involves matrix multiplication, <laughs> and then invoking the copper smith winograd bound in order to describe the uh, complexity of your algorithm. Somebody else talk for a minute. I 
what's calling an algorithm is that we haven't analyzed heuristics. I mean, they are algorithms. We just played not to the theorem about them, but I don't think we should disparage them by giving them a different name. Um, it's taken me a long time to train myself not to do this. But my students clearly think less of me if I call something a heuristic just because I can't prove the theorem about it. it especially if there are other professors who are telling them it works. I'd love for you to call them naive algorithms. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's in my undergrad class, I have a lecture or two on heuristics. Mm -hmm. And I do say heuristic is just an algorithm that theorists haven't figured out how to prove anything about. So that we call it something yeah. else. Yeah, um, yeah, well, the first thing is, the congressman says it's okay. <laughs> um, so I, I think uh, Lipton calls certain algorithms uh, galactic algorithms, because they have good asymptotics but bad performance, <laughs> uh, AKS sorting, for example. And, and so we sort of fall into the mindset sometimes that taking those seriously in an applied context as well as a, a theoretical one and making fools of ourselves and talking with uh, practitioners. The other, the other thing is that, um, you know, I've tried with uh, mixed success to make some impact on molecular biology. It's extremely difficult. And when you're talking with um, practitioners, you really have to listen to figure out what they want. And um, it's very easy to jump to a simplistic conclusion or a simplistic model after turning off your hearing after the first 10 minutes and being reminded of some analogy with something that you knew and advising them and just going off in the wrong direction. So I think that uh, if you really want to cross the boundary towards applications from time to time, you have to be a really good listener, and what you think the problem is in the first place may be quite different from what it really is. Right, so maybe, maybe one more talk on the floor, and then we'll go to conclude your remarks and panelists. How do you feel that you look at the history of mathematics? Some of the best mathematics come from physics and equations to biology. The different dimensional equations from all of At some point, they will look at physics, they buy ideas, they develop mathematics, and they develop their own. And I think that was a very valuable for I think that the computer science should follow that early in mathematics and look at applications, see what is interesting, and identify which problems are general towards the study, and which are engineering for that problem. If you are engineering challenges, identify the global challenges and use these considerations for applications to the theories that are who have life on their own and the interests of their own. All right, so uh, to make sure we finish it at a decent hour, uh, because the panelists have had So, so somehow there are certain things 
if I have a theorem that catches the imagination and also rigorous enough to somehow to explain something few weak, it's it kind of uh, exciting. But but although I don't know, you know, I think in different domains very differently. For example, in my spare time, influenced by my former PhD students, I designed board game. Right. So so when I design board game, then eventually I have to figure out that why my board game is good, right? So, so you know, like the chess is nice, the, the, Ch the Chinese go is, is great, you know. But what, what? so then you might talk to people who make games, and it's a, they, they, they give you this very interesting quantify. Then they, they, they say, you know, a game has to be beautiful, mostly two dimensional. A game has to be simple to describe. The rule cannot be more than half a page, right? That a game has to be complex. That you know. In many ways, that uh, uh, you cannot train a person who can consistently beat everybody else. Right? So, so for a long time, I don't understand what they mean, right? Because beautiful and two-dimensional is fine, but what do you mean a game is complex enough? Right? So then, finally, I talked to a friend of mine who is in combinatorial games, Dave Epstein, and he said, uh, "Yes, game has to be beautiful. Your geometry, of course, has to be two-dimensional. People don't play three-dimensional games." And the game has to be simple and clear, otherwise nobody will even try. He said, I have a simple theory about what game is complex. That is, you have to prove it's a decision problem, it's P-space complete. <laughs> right? So, so at least he, he can quickly transfer from game is complex, has no quantifier, at least using, you know, because game is automation, and the, the, the hardest instrument of automation is P-space complete. So, so then he quickly moved from there and, and you know then when I look back clearly a lot of game has that result, right? Like you know the Nash hacks game is this complete you know Crystal did a lot of such proofs. So 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 I guess as a theoretician we're constantly calling chain of uh, this sort of informal statement and we somehow try to get mathematical statement and there will be gap and but sometimes we feel we catch the imagination. I think in closing up uh, the statement, uh, primarily for students, uh, although maybe also their advisors, <laughs> um, this is something that uh, uh, you know, maybe I'm already preaching again to the choir here, because so maybe you already sort of think this way, uh, which is like over time, and maybe it's just I'm like, getting older and crotchier, um, I sort of feel like our, the people coming into our field or going through grad school are, are narrowing. You know, that they come in and they say they want to do theory, a lot of places, you know, uh, class requirements have sort of died away or other requirements have sort of died away. And so they go in coming to do theory and they don't look outside. Uh, and I really think part of a good grad student training uh, is having, is learning more about the field other than, let's say, just theory, but learning more about computer science generally, you know, maybe doing a practical project or, or, or implementation stuff. I was served in, in good stead at Berkeley at the, at the time I was there. We actually had you know, distribution requirements. And they were, uh, I won't say I loved them all. There were several of the courses I hated, more than a few that I slept through. Um, but you know, overall, the, the process of going through those classes not only introduced me to some useful things, some ideas and, and concepts that were useful later on, but also introduced me to people that were interesting and useful later on. cultural aspect that, that I worry about is that uh, that relates to this idea of beyond worst case analysis, looking sort of outside our, our norm, uh, is that it's important that we keep our communication both with the rest of the field and with other fields to understand uh, how computer science is important and where it should be going. Um, two quick points. We're entering an era of massive data, massive data uh, uh, facilities, um, uh, multi-core computing, uh, streaming, property testing, uh, sublinear algorithms. I think we have an opportunity to um, really um, reshape 
those areas, if we stay in contact uh, and make real uh, with the practitioners and make realistic models. So the you know the algorithms of the future will be increasingly in that large data context, and it's a, in some ways a new ball game. And uh, I think we have a, a good chance to contribute if we if we don't isolate ourselves. Um, in response to Dan's comment about how uh, you'll have good experience with an algorithm recommended to somebody else and then find that it fails, um, I think there are also situations where uh, people will encounter the, the same the same type of instance over and over over a long period of time. If you're dispatching taxi cabs in New York City, then probably the uh, routing problems that you face in the future will be very similar to those that you faced in the past. So I think there are situations where learning from instances, tuning and validating algorithms by statistical investigation of how they perform on training sets uh, will have a place. It's not exactly the kind of thing that we're used to doing. It's more in the realm of statistics and machine learning, um, but I do think that it's uh, quite important. with the practitioners, I think it's very important like, to inform ourselves of what's going on. I don't think we should, we are the people who should solve all problems in the world. I'm pretty happy to be on the side of proving the theorems and not necessarily directly influencing any particular project, let's say, like right project. And the way I view interaction why we need this interaction is part of it is to help us formulate, let's say, questions and theorems which are more relevant, but eventually the way I see it, we should, at least it's part of the community should be really coping with theorems, the general principles, things like that, and uh, the interaction, also this part of the community that is doing it, it's good to be informed by what's going on in the world, but, uh, uh, there's much value just for basic theoretical research and uh, not necessarily related to any particular application. Okay, well, I'll close with a call to arms. So, for years I used to go around saying to everybody who wanted to hear it that I, the invention of algorithms was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And the change now is that I'll actually believe it. And um, I think that. Uh, uh, behind uh, the difficulty of most of the newer sciences, so like school physics, chemistry, and so on, lies um, an enigma that is at heart essentially algorithmic. And I believe that the field of algorithms will look unrecognizable in 50 years from now. Of course, number theory will look pretty much the same. And, uh, and I think we, at the same time, we should 
be aware that we know extremely little about algorithms, and but we should also, that's a contradiction, but we should also, I think, be very self-confident, show perhaps more ambition and more self-confidence, and uh, that this is just simply the most glorious concept that we have the good luck to be, uh, you know, dealing with at this time. I really believe that. I think that's a fine way to end Thank you.